Well, thank you, first of all, for having me and for um, opening up the doors for human-centered design in government, because that is an increasingly important topic, and I hope I can illustrate a little bit why and what this can contribute. So let me begin with the title. Um, anyone can figure that out? Um, because I was inspired by the conference title, which read to me like EGOF, CIDEM, APART, and I had no idea what the heck was meant. So I thought like, okay, um, let's try that. Um, and this is the summary of my presentation, um, but let's try that again. So here is an example of human-centered design and non-human-centered design. This one creates barriers, and some of you and a few people that I know may figure it out, but the general population would really have trouble with that. Let's try that. Some of these words are maybe a little bit foreign too, and maybe we have to explain them, but at least you can begin to engage and you can begin to work with me on these issues here. So what I'm trying to um, present to you over the next 30 minutes is the idea of design in many different facets and its role in government. Some of you have probably a notion about what design is, what it's not, and I think I'll challenge some of that. I hope I will. Um, because for us in the design world, it's about inquiring into existing situations so that we can invent new possibilities. And the whole purpose for this is to integrate all that is around us around people. So if we work with an organization, we would like a service to be flowing through the organization and not stopping at one particular kiosk or stopping at one particular window clerk, but to understand how all of that hangs together so that the organization can be as efficient as possible, but the person who needs to get something out of the organization also actually gets um, what, what uh, the organization offers and can take full advantage of it. So, applying human-centered design to the challenges of future government, that be the theme. Does anybody know George Nelson? You actually do, because many of his design pieces are so popular in all the design stores that you're going and visiting occasionally on a Sunday afternoon. Um, but in 1979, George Nelson, by the way, in the midst of the Watergate scandal, uh, wrote a book which was called The Problems of Design. Now, this resonates with our time and age for a number of reasons, but one of them is that he actually points to the role of design in the organization, and he links that. And let me be clear that organization does not have to be a business. Organization does not have to be a public administration. Society is, in its own right, a form of organization. So let's think a little bit broad and big about the organization. But then we can come to this text and start thinking what does that actually mean. One of the most significant facts of our time is the predominance of the organization. Because we are people, we don't live individual lives isolated from everyone else. We're here at a conference, its own organization. We are at universities in groups. We organize continuously. So quite possibly, he says, this is the most significant. It will take time to realize its full effects on the thinking and behavior of individuals. But in this conditioning process, few escape its influence. I have a feeling, you know, it's now 2018, almost 40 years later. I have a feeling we're reaching that point that we're beginning to grasp what this influence is. Herbert Simon, anyone know him? Yeah. Anyone know he really engaged in design? Few, few hands. Herbert Simon, 10 years before um, George Nelson made this claim about organizations, kind of stirred the pot, so to speak, by saying that everyone who devises courses of action to turn an existing situation into a preferred one is a designer. This was a significant statement and it is significant because it means I'm working at a school of design, at the University of Design, but I have to realize there are many designers out there 
who do not have a design degree, who do not have training in design thinking, design methods, and other ways, but who are busy devising courses of action so that an existing situation improves in one way or another, and they are actually engaging in design activities. This is something that we have to keep in mind when we talk about designing government, because lo and behold, that's where we find a lot of people who have been going about design in many different ways, on many different levels, for many different reasons, but always with the idea to turn an existing situation into a preferred one. So when we talk about service design, this is always funny when I'm in a service design conference, <sighs> I'm such a bummer, I have to say you're not the only service designers. There have been service designers for the past 200 years in government everywhere. Now, they may not always do a good job because they don't have the training and they don't have the means, but guess what? They have conceived of, developed, planned, and delivered, and executed, and maintained services for centuries. Now, so this is then coming down to my own personal view of why we should even think about design in government. And I tried to capture that, um, first of all, in my, in my book, but uh, I, I want to just state this because people forget about it. I just said, if there are designers everywhere, even in government or especially in government, then we also have to start thinking that nowhere are our design practices, or how we go about designing, and our design methods, the methods we use, we employ to come about products and services, um, as consequential as in the areas of policy making and policy implementation. Services and other products that result from these design activities, they often shape the lives of millions of people. And the key difference with a government service, and you know that all here, people don't choose. You know, I can choose to become a customer of telecom or to buy a certain product or service, go to the fitness studio X, but I cannot choose to use certain services from government because I have an obligation as a citizen and I need these services in order to fulfill my obligation. Likewise, the government itself cannot choose about its customers. You know, it's so nice when you can develop personas and say like, I want the educated, I want the ones with the money above 100,000 per household, I want the ones who are smart. That's all great. Government has to be there for everyone. So this poses a completely different design landscape and design challenge. But it does affect millions of people. One single product, more so than most products ever in the, public, in the private sector. So for that reason, I say it is an area where human-centered design principles and methods can make a major contribution to achieve policy intents that involve public sector innovation and actual social changes. Actual social change goes through design. We don't connect that often. So when we say problems of design in the organization, it's all about conceiving, planning, developing, realizing, and implementing products and services that first and foremost have value and relevance to people. When you think about an organization, and now I challenge you to think about a private organization or a public organization. Think about what an organization is actually about. Any organization has to produce, to conceive, to, to offer something of value and relevance to someone else. If an organization fails in that capacity, it dies or it gets shut down. That's the purpose of an organization, to produce value and relevance and to deliver that through its products and services. So that means enhancing design capabilities within organizations that build on human experiences and human interaction are one of our challenges for design in government. <clears throat> so how do we go about designing? This is um, something I will explain a little bit more with this uh, mic. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so 
I have titled this the four core, uh, core activities of the organization. And I claim that no organization can get away without engaging in one of these activities. As a matter of fact, all organizations engage in these activities on an ongoing basis. And that hangs together with the idea that they have to produce something of value and relevance. So an organization has to develop something. That means they have to design. The moment, and this is going back to Herbert Simon, the moment we do design, we change something. You cannot design anything without making even the slightest change. When you do change, you have to organize. You don't just change. You have to organize and reorganize. And all this has to be managed. Now, there is an interrelation between these activities because you can, of course, design something very simple. Now, I, I always put on fancy dresses just to make sure I have something to show for. So, this is a jacket, right? But is it, if I redesign it, is it a dress? I can change it just like that. It's very superficial, right? But if I reconceive of this as a dress, hey, heck, that's a dress. I changed something, but what did I change? I actually didn't change the material, I didn't change the form, I didn't change the color, I changed your perception. That's what I did with the design. I changed your perception. We can make very different kinds of changes by design. You know it all, you've been there, iPod, iPhone, whatever. You know how you change your behavior. Anyone been in China recently? Yes. Have you noticed something? Have you seen people walking like this? Going down the stairs? It's scary, frankly. They walk in front of you going down the, the metro station and they go like this and you're like, either I fall over you or you fall down the stairs. I don't know. But <laughs> it's changing behavior, right? And this is not by accident. This is by design. So design changes. So we have to understand that when we design, we also relate to changes. When we change, we organize, we reorganize. Again, the question is, what is it that we organize and reorganize? I could change the buttons on this jacket, right? That would be a new design and I would reorganize and whatever. Just material changes, structural changes, behavioral changes. All of this requires reorganizing something. And when we talk about management, I'll just introduce two key concepts uh, in management that, that have significant relevance for how we go about designing. And the one is that we manage in a deterministic process, design process, where we already know what we actually want. And the other one, and that's called deterministic, and the other one is where we manage an open process where we don't know what we're looking for yet. We know that we want to improve a certain situation for certain people, but we have, we, we're giving it the chance to emerge. The solution is allowed to emerge. There's a different kind of management that underlies these two processes, and we need to A, be aware of it, and we need to become skilled in it. Um, what do I do with my clicker? This is a little funny. I think I put it there. It doesn't matter. So, when we talk about this, then we also have to think about um, why are we doing all that? I just told you, we can design in so many different ways. So what is our guiding principle? That's what it comes down to. Whatever you put in the center here of these activities will provide direction and guidance and will shape the outcome of your design activities. When we innovate around people, these activities take a different form. How do we go about designing? This will be the recurrent question that I will be asking you, just to trigger your own thinking and to hopefully start a reflection on your own design processes. Oops, sorry. How do we go about designing in the policy world? This is an interesting one. Um, I know Michael Howlett and Ramesh, by the way, personally by now, but I didn't when I started this model or critiquing this model from a design perspective. 
because this is an interesting approach where there's no person, there's no human being in this design approach. It is a fragmented linear design process. It begins somewhere after someone has identified or, or realized that we need to take action. But what exactly takes one to that spot, we don't know. It separates uh, the whole um, problem of um, creating a framework for services from the actual service development. What few people understand is that a policy in its own right is a design product. It doesn't grow on a tree. It doesn't just pop up in front of us. There are people involved who have thoughts, who have principles, who have um, an intention, who start creating something that's called a policy. And that policy is a particular product because it frames the way and the kinds of products and services that can come after it. It's a very interesting product when you think about it. I don't even know that there are many kinds of products like that out there. But in this particular model, how do we go about designing? People didn't talk about this as a design process. They think it's a decision-making model. When do you make a decision? When do you take the next step? The problem there is also when you really read, and you can, you can go deeper in my book probably, because it's very interesting when you start thinking about what happens here, then you realize, wow, we need data, data from the past so we can project in the future. Um, we are acting only when there is a problem. We are not proactive and anticipatory because by the time that we are actually uh, in, in, in need of action, it's too late to really do anything but react. Yeah? There's a design approach. How do we go about designing? Here is um, a bit of a, an, I wouldn't call it analysis, but uh, basically it is. It's, an, it's, it's a reflection on how organizations, public organizations, may go about designing. And these are not the only nine places there are, but for me they are kind of distinct positions um, demonstrating distinct relationships between the organization, citizens, and the whole design um, engagement. And I find, I'm wondering, is there, is, is there like a, a laser here? And no, no, no. Ah, that, yay, ha <laughs> User interface, no? Ah, that was pretty good, I got it in like two seconds, okay. Um, so, this is where most public organizations still work in. That is, they have, um, they're designing themselves. That means they know what they need. They think they know their citizens. They think they know their procedures. They think they have the knowledge and nobody else can help them really. Or they don't have the resources for anyone to help them. And so they go about designing what they need and they design for the citizen, right? So something's created in here and then it's put out and then the citizens have to cope with it. Um, we're seeing in these colorful areas new approaches that get into co-designing, participatory design, and uh, co-creation and co-production, whatever you want to call it. We will talk about that more, I think, in a panel. Um, but here is the idea that increasingly people in organizations are trying to create new possibilities to free themselves from what they know and to really start working with citizens to understand what is it that we can do differently? How can we work differently? What kind of um, products and services are actually helpful to you in the right place, in the right, at the right time, in the right format, and so on? And the interesting thing there is, this means that we're also reaching into the organization because this challenges us then to make changes within the organization in terms of procedures, structures, resources, and so on. So this is the area where we see um, innovation in the public sector moving forward. Now this, to be clear, innovation can happen in each one of those places, but they are happening for a different reason and with a, with a different means. And, um, depending on what somebody is after, 
this could be a good place to be. But my problem with the design in government and design in public organizations is nobody knows where they are. So if they have like a matrix like that, they go like, uh, uh, okay, uh, I didn't know you could do this. Uh, uh, no, I don't think we've ever tried that. And so it's this idea of opening up possibilities, which is what design is very good at and should be very good at, creating new possibilities to move forward, right? So this is a matrix, a design product in its own right, once again, but this one meant to help other people to open up new possibilities for going about public sector design. Um, since we're having a lot of conversation about co-design, co-creation, co-production, I thought it would be valuable to bring in the work by especially Elizabeth Saunders, but in particular this, this uh, diagram that she developed with uh, P.J. Stappers from um, Eindhoven, um, Delft, sorry, University of Delft. Uh, Elizabeth Saunders is at Ohio State in the US and, and uh, Pete is in um, Delft. And this kind of helps you understand a little bit how we approach design relationships and co-designing and user-centered design and human-centered design in, from a design perspective. And you can see there's these different areas. User as a subject, that's probably an area many here are familiar with. Um, there are user as a partner, an area where I think increasingly people here in the room are beginning to move into. And then there is this work that is led by research, which I, from the few conversations I have had in the room, have not noticed very dominant yet because research means often still being stuck to the product or the IT system or the technology or the uh, technological possibilities in e-government. But research here means, look at this, applied ethnography, meaning like I work with people in the organization and outside the organization and I try to find out what troubles them, where are the issues they have, how is their life working, and, and how does that, what we are developing, fit into their life situations? Um, of course, you have the classics, which is human factors and ergonomics, which will always um, be heated no matter what. So this, this is not an, I guess what I'm trying to say, this is not an either or situation. Again, it's more like a landscape where you can start to think about what am I doing? What are the other options? and what am I missing out on? So this work by Elizabeth Sanders, I will strongly recommend, look her up. <clears throat> she has done um, great work that will inform this area, especially when we talk about, and we had this conversation uh, about Scandinavian approaches to participatory design, which have come out of the work environment, whereas um, the work by Sanders has come out of design product development um, approaches. How do we go about designing? I have five minutes left, so I'm gonna speed up a little. Um, I mentioned that before, when you saw the policy cycle that I introduced from Howlett and Ramesh, and I said like, look guys, what you're missing out on, you don't think about service and people in the beginning, and that's what we have to do, which is why we have to do the research for that, because if we know what, uh, who we are designing for, what these people need, what they can do, and what kind of services we can envision, possibilities we can think together about what is possible here, then we can create policies that give the space for these services and people. And then we have the policy makers who can create the kinds of policies that allow policy implementation, i.e. the public administrations, to work on this because what we see then is we have here the product, the policy, we have here the product organizational change, and that together leads us to the idea of social change. How do we go about designing? Um, I'm gonna run through these slides, but they will feel very familiar to many of you. This is 
This is a, a real organization. I anonymized it, but it's a real organization. And look at this. They have innovation here, right? And wait a second, where's, where's the IT department? Oh no, it's so little. We are supposed to digitalize. Okay, let's make it big. Uh, there it is, right? Um, now we're happy, now we're good, now we can do digitalization. Oh, wait a second, we've overlooked something because now we put knowledge management down here. Oh, and isn't it that if we actually do this thing with digitalization, do we need different people? Do we need to include personnel? Do we need controlling finances, legal service, uh, and knowledge management maybe too? And maybe the one area that suffers from a pension reduction in, I mean, pension wave where people leave um, the organization. So if we put all this not only in the center, but we start to weave it together with other organizational issues and developments, and we start thinking about human-centered design, maybe we can develop new possibilities and new um, opportunities for the um, digital age for public sector innovation and also for better, more citizen-centric services. Right. Um, how do we go about designing? This is an example I will just share with you also very briefly. I'm proud to say this is 15 years old, actually almost 20. Um, and it's from the Australian tax office where they talked about, well, if we want to develop quality tax product, we do have to think about design practices. We have to think about design principles. And we have to, they use the design wheel, but it's actually about design process. Yeah? And they introduced human-centered design. This um, is great because it says, look, this is where we are here, but this is where we want to be. This is where we are in terms of process. This is where we want to be. This is where we are in terms of product and how we go about product development. This is where we want to be. And in terms of integration, organizational, and also in their case with the policy makers, this is where we are right now, and this is where we want to be. So they created a blueprint internally for how to move forward. And I love that because it still is one of the best examples to demonstrate how and why we should engage in these kind of approaches of inquiring, inventing, and integrating through human-centered design. I'm not going to show you that video, but these are students of mine. Um, mass, um, bachelor students who were challenged to think of the future of government and they came up, uh, it's a YouTube video, you can look it up, tailored taxes. Um, and it, it is the idea that uh, they said like, look, in the future, I don't mind paying tax, but I would like to have a say at least partially of where the money goes. And they came up with something that actually is quite viable. And afterwards, they learned that the, the Amt für Unlösbare Aufgaben in Heidelberg had a similar approach independently, which, by the way, tells you something. This is an idea that's floating. And we know that when ideas are floating, there's something about them. And we know that now we have to think about how to create the structural um, frameworks and the policy frameworks to make something like that happening. But we know those students are onto something, and um, we will probably see participatory um, taxation in one form or another over the next 10 years, I'm pretty sure. How do you go about designing? This is my last slide. By inquiring into human experiences, by inventing new possibilities for human interaction, and by integrating organizational systems. Thank you.